wanted to say thank you guys. My name is Robbie Harmon. I am the um, administrator here at Life Lessons with Biblical Answers. Glad to have you guys around and uh, definitely going to enjoy studying the Word with you all. We're in the Book of Romans, and we will be in the Book of Romans for about 26, or excuse me, 26 weeks. Yeah, 12 weeks, somewhere in there. You know, we'll be in there somewhere. Um wanted to say uh but we'll get in there we're going to get in and dig in can't tell you exactly how long we're going to be doing the book of romans but i want to have a good time with it i want to enjoy it i want you guys to enjoy it too we're going to really dive deep into this because romans is an absolutely fantastic book uh it has a great deal of doctrine in it for the christian church to live in to breathe in to be a part of and to allow uh, for God to work in us and to be able to build fellowship with one another. Even if we don't see eye to eye perfectly, we can go and we can work together to build Christ's body together and be united in him. So the book of Romans has a lot to offer, and we are going to be discussing that in some detail, as I said. So, well, let's see what we can do here. I know you're all sick of seeing my mug, so how about this? There we go. Looks better there already. Uh, we're going to be studying in the book of Romans. As I said, we're going to be going through details in the book of Romans. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, the introduction notes tonight. We'll be going through uh, where the book, where, who was uh, Romans written to, the writer of Romans, all that other wonderful stuff. You'll have all that as well. But you'll also we'll be getting into uh, chapter 1 going through verses 1 through 7. Now, a lot of people say, well, that don't sound like a whole lot of study. But Romans 1, 1 through 7 has quite a bit in it that we can look at and grow from, and it's a great place to start off at. First off, just to let you know, um, get you a Bible, first thing. I know a lot of people look at me and go, well, it's a Bible study. I should have my Bible, right? If you haven't got a Bible yet, get one, okay? Get your Bible out. Pull up uh, BibleGateway.com. Do whatever you need to do. Get you a Bible handy. I'll have some of it up here on the screen, but at the same time, with it being over on that end, it's not going to help, you know, as far as that all the time because I may have a verse here. I may not have a verse there. I want you to pay close attention. I want you to pay close attention to studying and seeing what these scriptures say to us. So we need to be able to let God work in us through his word. So have your Bible ready. I also encourage you to take notes. If you've got a pencil, pen, and paper, wonderful. Good start. That's how you want to study with this. This is don't and first thing, don't take my word for it. Don't just listen to the preacher. Please take time out to actually get the Bible out, study what it says, and look at what it says. You'll be surprised how much more you'll learn when you actually get hands on with God. So don't just listen to me. Listen to what God's Word says. Take time out and actually study the Scripture. And I'll have questions for you at the end that you can go over. And I will also be posting uh, this uh, uh, PowerPoint as well so that you'll have those questions as well. So if you need anything else, you can refer to that as well on there. All right, let's get into the meat, shall we? All right, let's start with the book of Romans here. We're going to be talking about the authorship. Authorship is found within the very first word of the epistle. It says Paul. Well, that's pretty simple. We know who wrote the book of Romans. It is Paul. He makes sure that this epistle is given an authorship. Now, Paul is the inspired writer. We find out later in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 22, that he actually has a scribe working with him. Even though the scribe is working with him, he's dictating exactly what Paul is saying to him. That's what's going on. That's how that happens. So get involved with that, and that's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to get involved. He's writing what Paul's saying and getting into it at 100 miles an hour. So when you read what is going on here, you are reading Paul's words that are inspired and given by God. This is not just some... A uh, fellow writing it off the street corner and just coming up with some kind of rhyme. No, this is actually a man inspired by God, being dictated by God, saying, look, this is what you're doing. And he's having somebody dictate him at the same time. This ensures the accuracy in the writing as well. So it helps to be able to know that 
Paul is describing himself as only, it could only be Paul, as you find not just in the very first verse, but in uh, chapter 11, verse 13, you can cross-reference uh, verse 15, or chapter 15, verses 15 through 20, and Acts 9 and 26, you can see that he is in there. Now, as far as the date and the writing goes, there's strong indication that it was written in Corinth on the third missionary journey, which was about 57 to 58 AD. Okay, so you're looking in that point, 57 to 58 AD. A key for the dating in this collection for the uh, for these saints, okay, this, these poor saints. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2, 3, and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the funds were being collected for the poor at that point. Paul was taking the contributions of the churches of Macedonia and Achaia to the poor saints there. Now, Paul and certain other brethren were in Corinth on that third mission at that time and were well on their way to Jerusalem with the offering for those poor saints. And you can cross-reference that in Acts 19, 22, 23, through, or 20, chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. So lots that you can follow up with there on that. It was probably written at Corinth because the names of two people associated with the city were mentioned as being present with Paul at the time of writing. Okay, so there were two people there and they were at Corinth at the same time. You can cross-reference that in Romans 16.23 and 1 Corinthians 1.14, okay, and 2 Timothy 4.20. I know, see what I'm saying? Lots of scripture being shouted out. So. Just kind of follow up with that. If you need those verses again, we want to be able to help you. We want to be able to help you study with that. Uh, I will have this entire outline plus the notes I have uh, that I've been working with. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I've gotten several wonderful congregations that are Christian church, churches of Christ that have helped me out and uh, are allowing me to use their material and get into their study. And I uh, also want to thank personally as well at this time uh, I want to th thank Scott Sheridan uh, for his website and for all that he's been doing uh, for uh, getting some of the study materials together with uh, Roger Chambers. Roger Chambers, if you've never heard Roger Chambers speak, I will leave a link uh, in the description over here. I'll have a link in there and I want you to go to that sometime. I want you to study along with this Roger Chambers is one of the best when it comes to studying Romans. I had a good time listening to him and getting a lot of this information prepared with that as well. So lots going on, lots of good study with him as well. So taking place, uh, the place of writing is Corinth. Of course, as I said, Paul spent three months there and all. Um, Romans was written just before his visit to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Gaius and Arrestus were in Corinth too. Phoebe, who may have carried the letter, lived in Corinth at that point. The recipient of the letter. Let's have a look at this. The letter was written to the saints in Rome. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about that come verse 7 of chapter 1, okay? But it's written in address to the saints. Um, we know nothing about the church at Rome or when it was established. So, when you go and you follow his missionary track, okay, when you actually go and start reading and getting involved with where he's going, okay, we, we don't know who founded the Roman church. We seriously don't. The only thing we know was that this was probably written on his third missionary journey, which you can follow there in the red uh, on the map. Uh, but no one knows precisely who founded the church at Rome. Now, it could have been anybody at this point. Now, uh, the congregation's origin, Paul had never been to Rome and did not establish a church in Rome. There's no biblical evidence that Peter or any other apostle had ever been to Rome. Now, as I said, this includes Peter. Now, why do I underline that and say it twice? That means it's pretty important because there are people that will tell you that the church at Rome was founded by Peter. I'm not going to point fingers, okay? I'm not going to point fingers and say this group believes in this and this group doesn't. But there are people that will tell you and stay and just stay on it to say, I'm not going, I'm not going to give this up. Peter was the founder of the church. He was the first apostle to start this and that's, and he was the one that founded the church. He was the one that founded the church at Rome. No, 
There's no evidence of that. The exact start date of the church in Rome is not even known. It appears to have existed for some time based on the information that we have in those verses in chapter 1, verse 8, uh, verse 13, uh, in uh, chapter 15, 23, and chapter 16, 19. Okay, so lots and lots to study there. Follow that out. No, we don't know the day when it starts, but we do have a pretty good indication that this is a church that is an older one. This is not one that was just founded by Paul on his missionary journey. This is one that had been there for some time. Now, this does bring about some questions. First off, the first converts in Rome may have been among those scattered after the death of Stephen, according to Acts 8, 4-1. They could have been the ones that went and left out of Jerusalem, that went out and uh, went outside and spread the news. Uh, when we read in the book of Acts, in chapter 7 and 8, after Stephen's death, there was a great scattering of believers. Well, the believers left because persecution had come. They were going to be killed, jailed, all sorts of things going on, in, or if they ever were found out to be part of the church. So, these people went out. And they went out everywhere, including Rome, okay? So they may have been the ones that were scattered on that. Now, converts of Paul from other regions who had moved in there likely were ones that were part of that congregation church, too. They were probably among the first people that came in. Now, as I say, we don't have a whole lot of information as who was in there, but we know for certain that there were people that Paul knew that people knew personally because he mentions people by name and all these different things going on. He mentions all these people so you know that he has a connection with this church. Okay, Now there is what is referred to, and this is Roger Chambers that came out there, as a Pentecostal sojourner. Okay, These are people that came from Rome to the church or, or to uh, the meeting in Jerusalem at Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, these were Jewish people, Jewish believers, who came to know Jesus Christ at the day of Pentecost. They went from that point and took that over to Rome. That could have been, that could have been where it started as well. We are not for certain. We don't know these things. We can't have 100% detail, but we do know that there were Romans present at the day of Pentecost as we read in Acts 2 verse 10. Now both Gentiles and Jews were part of the church. With it being in Rome, with it being in Rome, there's going to be, of course, more Gentiles than Jewish folks. So you're going to see that kind of go through in the lesson that we're learning because these two groups have a really hard time coexisting. These two groups have a lot of problem coexisting. And so what Romans tends to do is show and illustrate that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right. The basics of the letter. Okay. Let me just kind of give you a real easy breakdown of this. Theologically and practically engaging. Okay. So better said, theology-wise, you're not going to find too many books in the Bible that are as deep and intense as the book of Romans. Everybody's got something to say about the book of Romans and all sorts of denominations, all sorts of belief systems, they all have different feelings about the book of Romans. But we're not caring what people are saying. We don't want to go by what men's teaching are. Okay, We don't want to go by what men are teaching. We want to go by what the Bible says. And, uh, that's, what, that's what Roger Chambers in his lessons kind of pointed out as well. Roger was one to say, look, you can go and have the book of Romans, but it's like handing dynamite to a drunk guy if you don't handle it right. And he's sound the money because the book of Romans is spiritual dynamite. It is powerful. And if it is treated right, it can be used to encourage and build the body. But it can also be very destructive if we choose to use it the wrong way. We need to be unifying, not disabling. Okay, We need to unify the church, build the church, not destroy it. So that's how we're going to take the approach to Romans. Okay, So the basics of this letter, first off, theologically, practically engaging. Okay. Starts with a lengthy introduction, okay? He goes and does an introduction of himself, Paul. No, it's not just Paul. He goes into 17 verses, and our first couple of lessons are going to talk about that introduction. 
It's a very lengthy personal conclusion as well, as he mentions 26 members by name. As said, he has a large influence in the Roman church. And maybe some of his belief, maybe some of the people that came to believe after getting to know Paul went and matriculated up to the Roman church. Heavy use of the Old Testament, and this connects with Jewish believers, okay? So Jewish people understand Scripture. They understand Old Testament because those Jewish people are going to be living Old Testament, okay? The New Testament is being written as Paul is doing this. So he is using Old Testament Scripture to say, look, guys, you Jewish folks, listen to me when I say this, okay? This is why this is important. He engages in deep diving into major Christian topics such as sin, wrath, death, uh, law, righteousness, justification, the whole lot. He doesn't stop. He keeps building and building and growing on what needs to be taught in all aspects. Okay? So the book is often divided into two parts. Okay? Chapters 1 through 11 are doctrinal and theological. How to be just. How to be living a righteous life through Jesus Christ. Chapters 12 through 26 are more practical in saying how do we live by faith? How do we go and live by what we believe in? How do we correspond with our brothers and sisters in Christ? How do we engage in that? First, how do we engage with God? Second, how we engage with people. What did Jesus say the two big the two big parts of um, the two commandments are the two greatest commandments what are the two greatest commandments love God love your neighbor that's exactly the way Paul is preaching this love God love your neighbor keep building on that okay and that is exactly where Paul goes with this now the occasion of the letter I'm tickled to death that Roger had this outlined as well and I wanted to use it and give him the credit on this because it's a fantastic understanding of the, to understand why the letter was written in the first place. There are all sorts of reasons as to why this book was written. Okay, What is the occasion of the letter? Well, first, it was to announce and prepare for an upcoming visit to Rome. This is mentioned within that scripture. He would like to go to Rome. He would also was wanting to secure financial aid for a trip to Spain. Okay, We see that in uh, chapter 15, verse 24. We'll talk about that at the time of service there. Uh, and also in s chapter 16, verse 1, he commends Phoebe and talks about her in some detail. Okay, Now, here's some other parts that might not be agreed with. Liberal theologians say it is to start Pauline, and I put that in quotation marks, Pauline Christianity. Well, what's Pauline Christianity? See, Liberals tend to put it into two contexts. The law, which was carried out by Peter, and grace, which was carried out by Paul. And neither the two shall meet. The truth of the matter is, there is no such thing as a Cephas, as a Cephas Christianity and a Pauline Christianity. There is only Christianity, period. There's no such thing as division in Christ. When you study 1 Corinthians, you see that in some detail. I hear from some of Chloe's people that you guys are dividing up. Of course, this is paraphrased. Some are calling for. Some are saying I'm a Cephas. Some are saying I'm of Apollo. Some are saying I'm of Paul. Has Christ been divided? Has Paul died for your sins? And that's what he says. This has zero to do zero to do with the division. It has nothing to do with division. It has everything to do with unifying the body. Paul did not preach another gospel that Peter didn't, okay? And Peter didn't preach a gospel that Paul didn't, okay? It's not, there's nothing like that. There's no division. Both saw eye to eye when it came to knowing Jesus Christ. And we'll talk more about those as we get into the study. To express his sense of responsibility as there were many converts in the Roman church that were made under him. Okay, So we have that understanding that there are people that are traveling up there. There have been people that are there. Those things are part of that. Uh, there's also an issue with Judaizers. Judaizers are people who were very legalistic Christians. Okay, 
These are people that said, okay, you can be a Christian, but first you have to be a Jew. Okay, so that means you've got to go through circumcision, you've got to study, you've got to know this, you've got to go that. You've got to follow the law and be a Christian. Not true. And Paul makes emphasis of that. Not true. Okay, if anybody comes and tells you that you've got to do this stuff and that stuff, that's not right. You can't do that. He'll mention that in Romans 14. We'll get into that in some detail. The uh, assembly was without apostolic oversight. Okay. Thus, Paul wanted to give them an orderly, comprehensive statement of the Christian faith. He wanted to be able to help guide them. He knew that there wasn't a Peter, or there wasn't a Matthew, or there wasn't somebody up there that was doing the, the work of the apostles. Okay, So he was essentially the Roman apostle. He was going up there and talking to them, encouraging them, and giving them a set, specific statement of the walk with Christianity. And it's also to address the problem of broken fellowship between Jews and Gentiles and the mutual reluctance to evangelize the other culture. Jewish people did not like Gentiles. And you can see that by the way the temple is made up. The temple in Jerusalem, all the Jews were up front. All the Jewish men were up front. The Gentiles, and this tells you where the Jewish folk thought of women as well, were right behind the women. Okay, Gentiles were behind the women. They were the dirt. They were filth, and they were nasty. Then came women, and women weren't much higher on the scale than them. And that's pretty bad to say, but it's the truth. Unfortunately, several things during that time period between the Old Testament and New Testament led to people really hating women in ministry and really taking it out on them. Uh, but... As we find out in the New Testament, we see many cases where women are helping and encouraging people to understand what, who Jesus Christ is and helping others to grow in that and still maintaining a scriptural presence. Okay? So that was from Roger Chambers as far as the occasional letter. I love that. I think it's wonderful, and I hope you enjoy that too. Now, let's get into the primary theme of the letter. Okay? The primary theme of this is justification is available to man only through obedient faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand that. Obedient faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel of Christ is God's plan and the only plan. There's no other way to get to heaven but through Jesus Christ. Jesus' his own words, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The, it, absolute only way. That's how he puts it. And he's the only way for all men to obtain salvation from sins and to be accounted righteousness, a righteous in the eyes of God. Okay, That's where our righteousness lies. It doesn't lie in anything I can do. It doesn't do in anything that you can do. It all lies within what Christ has done done for us it's through Jesus Christ we are saved and that is the biggest point we can have and the biggest thing we need to tell people that we can't do it but Christ has done it and he opens the door all he says is we need to seek him out and obediently follow him just as the disciples did when he was calling them out he said follow me they got up they went they didn't think about it they just did it. So the theme is summarized at the beginning of the book in uh, Romans 1, 16 through 17, and then developed throughout the book. We'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. Obedient faith. Now notice I say this again. Obedient faith is emphasized at the beginning and the end of the books in chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 16, 26. Obedient faith. Faith is emphasized throughout the book in chapter 2, verse 8, 5, 19, 6, 1 through 16, and 17, uh, 10, 16, and 16, 19. All of those verses, I want you to take time out to study those. Write those down because those are going to be important to get over there, look at that, see what it says, and write those down. Take time out to read those verses and see what obedient faith entails. 
Obedient faith is what Christ expects out of us. There are some people that would say you can be saved by believing only, by faith alone. The problem with faith alone is I can go and believe, but even the demons believe. That's what James says. And James isn't contradicting uh, Paul's disciple or Paul's uh, letter here, his epistle to the Romans. He's not going and saying, no, 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 we can't do that. You can't do that. He's not saying something that's contrary to that. No, he's going right along with Paul and saying, look, we have to have an obedience to the gospel. We need to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Romans is a book that emphasizes faith, but not faith alone. Obedience, but not obedience in man-made doctrine. And faith that obeys and emphasizes obedience through faith. Okay, so take those notes, write those down. Romans is a book that emphasizes faith, but not faith alone. Obedience, but not obedience in man-made doctrine. Okay, so you can't go too far with that, either side. Now, I've talked about that before on the live cast before. I've talked about going one side or the other. You can go too far on the legalistic side. You can go too far on the uh, grace side. If you go too far on either side, you're going to end up falling short. You've got to stay on the straight and narrow. You've got to be focused on what Jesus wants, not what man wants and not what man wants. Both sides are what man wants. We don't make the dictation here. We don't make the decision to follow what rules we want to follow. We stay true to what Jesus says. That's it. And so that's why we need to have faith that obeys and emphasizes obedience through faith. Okay? Being true. All right. So here's just a general outline. Basically, uh, the introduction uh, is from 1 through 17. Sin, the need for God's righteousness, of course. We'll talk about Jews, Gentile, and universal. You just go through that right there. If you want to save on to that, jot that down. You know, you can look at that later. I will also be posting this, as I said, on... Uh, I'll be posting this on the website and connecting that up over in the uh, description over here as well so that you can go to it and uh, download that as well so you can follow along with it. All right. Also, if uh, you don't have, and this is one thing I try to emphasize to people, if you do not have, um, uh, inter if you don't have Microsoft PowerPoint, what you can do is you can use Google's tools as well. Google uh, has a uh, program called Slides Online that allow you to open up PowerPoint presentations and read them. So there you go. You can go and pull that up, and read along with that. If you have any questions, get back with us. You can follow up with that, okay? So there we go. There's your general outline of the book. Now we get into the meat. Let's go ahead, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we're going to break down. I will be using the New American Standard in our study. Now, that doesn't mean I'm telling anybody that that is the only Bible there is. I'm telling folks that this is what I use when I do preaching and studying. And I encourage everybody, if you want to get one, go ahead and get you one like that. You can go on, like I say, to uh, uh, BibleGateway.com and pull that up as well. It'll work just fine. And uh, just take your time with it. If you're reading King James, if you're reading New International Version, whatever, that's fine. Just know that I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard, and uh, that's usually where I preach out of and what I teach out of. So if you hear things or see things that kind of doesn't match, that's where it's at. So if you want to find that, find a copy of that, you're welcome to. All right, start at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophet in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all his Gentiles for his namesake among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved in God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Seems like a really simple introduction, doesn't it? Well, we're going to talk about it here for a minute. We're going to break it down in some details, and I hope you got you ready. I hope you're ready to jot some things down because we're going to have some excitement with this. Okay, so in chapter one, verse one seven. Okay, this is Paul's introduction right here. Okay, he is set apart for the gospel of God. That's what he is called out to be. He's separate. Okay, that's a word that we have in scripture that talks about us as well okay it comes to it helps us to come up with the word sanctification sanctification is being set apart for a holy purpose okay this is part of that being set apart for the gospel of god okay he is an apostle set apart okay so he is a witness to what god has done through jesus christ all right Paul's credentials, all right? His relationship is he was a servant of Jesus Christ. Here's a really interesting part of that word, okay? When you look at the word servant, when you get into the word servant in Scripture, the word servant details what they are, okay? It's not just saying that they are a servant, that they've got... Uh, a towel and they're going and, and, and taking care of the table or taking care of this or taking care of that like you would think as a servant at a at a restaurant or something like that. No, no, no. This is the word doulos. Okay? A doulos is a slave by choice. Okay? They are choosing. They are giving up their freedom their freedom in order to be part of the one they serve. Okay, to be called by the one they serve. And that would be, of course, that would be Jesus Christ whom he serves. His office is he is an apostle. Now that is also found in verse 5. No one here is going to dispute or argue the apostleship of Paul. Although there are some discussions in that. He did see Jesus Christ. He, he more than likely was a witness to the death, the burial, and resurrection as he was in Jerusalem learning under Gamaliel. So he was present in Jerusalem. And his office is there. That's what his office, that's what his station is. He is there as an apostle. His work is to be is separated to the gospel, okay? He is set apart to preach the gospel. That's what he's there for. No other purpose to, but to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and declare that Jesus is the Son of God. He's set apart for it even from birth, according to Galatians 1.15. Now, the gospel has two modifiers here. Okay, verses 2 and verses 3, which we'll get into here just a little bit, all right? The gospel in verses 2 and 3, it says here, the gospel was divinely promised in their own scriptures, okay? So in the Jewish scriptures, in the Hebrew text, there was a promise of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Not just once, but many times in scripture, you know, we can read in the book of Genesis chapter 3, we read about the one who would come and crush the serpent's head. We know that that is the forerunner. That is the, the last Adam. That is Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about the first and the last Adam later on in the book of Romans. But that is mentioned within Scripture. And it also points out to the Lord's dual nature. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about a dual nature? He is declared to be the Son of God, according to verse 4. Okay, So that's part of his dual nature. He is not just a person. He is not just an ordinary man. He is also the Son of God. So with that stated, he is also fully God and fully man. He is dualistic. He has become flesh and blood, just like you and I. And the same way, he is also fully God, just as the Heavenly Father is, just as the Holy Spirit is, so too is Jesus Christ. Declared to be the Son of God, that is determined or demonstrated. Well, how is it demonstrated? With power. It's demonstrated with power, manifested by miracles. When you read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one thing you'll notice in every single one of them, Miracles are being done through the hands of Jesus Christ. Miracles are there to affirm 
that Jesus is who he says he is. That he's not just some trickster. He's not just some charlatan. He's not out for your wallet. He is out to get your soul. He is out to encourage and inspire you. He is there to bring you to God as his people. That is what his power entails. His power is manifested by miracles. The spirit of holiness, his holy spiritual nature, once again, fully man, fully God. A very spiritual nature. He has the spirit of holiness. He is not with flaw like we are. He is flawless as God is. By the resurrection of the dead, Okay, the resurrection from the dead, the greatest of the miracles and ultimate proof that God was in charge. And moreover, Jesus was who he said he was. He said, if you bury me three days, I will return. He did. He did not go and ju we didn't jump to any conclusions. We didn't have any false ideas. He proved who he was. And that by the resurrection from the dead was the greatest of the miracles and the ultimate proof that he was who he said he was. Through him, according to verse 5, we have received grace. Okay? We have received grace. His authority, both his favor and office were not from any man or of the church. Okay? You can check out Galatians 1, 10 through 11. It emphasizes that point. This was not given by man. It was not given by the church. It wasn't a declaration that said, okay, we're going to worship this Jesus guy now, and we're going to follow him. You all listen to what he's... No, it wasn't given by John the baptizer. It wasn't done by John the immerser. It was done by God, okay? His authority, all right? So Jesus' authority is found through his office, not, not through us and not through the church. Not through any man, but through the power of God. Obedience of faith, according to the New American Standards here, okay? Now, obedience of faith. The obedience which is based on faith and springs from faith, okay? So it can be based on faith or springs from faith. And either way, it comes about through our faith. Our obedience isn't because... We have to do it. It's because we choose and want to do it. Remember doulos? That's exactly what we need to be. We need to be as Paul is. Paul was a doulos. He was one that wanted to be able to give his life willingly for Jesus Christ. We too need to be willing to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Obedience of faith and obedience to the faith. Okay. Now, when you go and start studying this little part right here, it can get a little wild. Through him, we have received grace. Okay, so we're going to continue like that. Among all the nations, all men everywhere. Okay, so that's in Acts 17, 30 through 31. Let's talk about that obedience of faith, okay, for just a moment. You'll see several different versions on here. As the American Standard and the New American Standard say, obedience of faith. The King James and the New King James Version reads, obedience to the faith. The NIV says, obedience that comes from faith. And the NCV says, believe and obey. Now, these show the importance of obedient faith. It doesn't say that you're saved and you're free to do whatever you want to do, which we'll also talk later on in the book of Romans. This says we need to be obedient to the gospel. We need to be obedient not just to the gospel, but the one who died for us, who is Lord of all. Paul opens and closes the letter with the power of this faith as we mentioned before. Those who do not obey the truth will receive indignation and wrath. You can check that out up ahead in chapter 2, verse 8, if you want to. We must walk in the steps of our father Abraham. That's for the Hebrew believers to say, look, we need not just to believe in father Abraham. We don't get the inheritance because we are attached to Abraham. We have to embrace Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay? We have to embrace Jesus Christ. And that is the call of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that. Among whom? Among the nations, right? The called. The called? 
Now, does that mean that we're predetermined? Are we predetermined to be a part of Christ? You know, if there are people that will argue that. Now, my understanding, based on what Scripture says, is that would not be right. Because if we're predetermined, and if somebody sway, strays out of salvation, and, well, they're not lost, you know, or anything like that, well, Satan would be saved in that instance, wouldn't he? Because he was, a, he was created by God the same way. But he fell. He fell to sin. And he continued in living in sin. Does that mean that Satan can go and have his grace back on that end? God's grace is merciful. But think about this. Satan's one goal is to destroy us and, and hurt the Father. The only way we can come and be able to serve God willingly, openly, and lovingly is by being God's. Satan doesn't want to have anything to do with God. We have to be different than that. So, when I see the word called, I'm not saying predetermined. Not by any means. You can check 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. The called, chosen, and faithful are used in one verse in Revelation 17, and four, uh, verse 14. By virtue of being called of Christ, they belong to Christ. That is where we get the title Christian from. We are owned by Christ. We are part of Jesus Christ. There's nothing about that that says I am a part of anything else other than Jesus Christ. That is who we belong to. That is who we are called out to. From, uh, from this world to be a part of and so we need to be able to be called of Christ it is not a predetermined nature it is one we choose and accept as doulos for Christ called to be saints okay called to be saints what do I mean by called to be saints it's written to the Roman Christians okay called to be saints written to Roman Christians Beloved of God, God loves all, but he loves his children in a very unique way, according to 1 John 3, 1. Called to be saints, to be holy ones, a people set apart for God. Sound familiar? We talked about sanctification a little bit ago. Sanctification means that you are set apart for a holy purpose. It is where we get the word saint from. It is how we, as Christians, are labeled. We are called out to be holy. Now, some people don't like hearing that. In fact, they try to shy away from it. I'm not holy. You're right. I'm not holy. I'm not holy. That my holiness comes from Jesus Christ, from the Father who guides my guides my direction, and through the Holy Spirit, He re, He resides within me and indwells within me, so that I can come out here and talk to you about these things. So, call to be saints. I'm Saint Robbie. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's ludicrous. You can't be. Well, you're saint such and such. If you're a Christian, you're called to be a saint. You can be a Saint Paul. You can be a Saint Mark. You can be a Saint Jude. You can be saint. But that means you don't have to wait for somebody to canonize you. God has canonized you through the working in the blood of Jesus Christ. You are canonized through Jesus Christ. But that means you've got to live a holy life. Doesn't that sound something? Doesn't it sound like something to be a part of, something bigger? It is big. It's important that we are seeking to be sanctified, to be set apart for a holy purpose, and to be saintly. Grace to the saints, okay? No greater blessing could be wished or granted to the faithful. Grace be to you, and grace be to the church. We need to be able to respond to one another in grace and pray for one another and, and say that God is with us. He is with us all the time. There is no greater blessing than to know that God's grace is over us and that God's mercy and his hand direct us. Now, that's getting through verse 7 there. Now, I want to talk to you just a little bit about what we want to do for next time. Okay? We're going to talk about two big questions I've got for you, okay? So I want you to jot these down, all right? Jot these down. Um, obedience of faith, okay? Obedience of faith. 
I want you to study more on obedient faith in the Word, okay? Take your Bible, and I want you to write these verses down. James 2, 20 through 26. James 2, 20 through 26. Hebrews 5, 9. Okay? Hebrews 5, 9. Hebrews 11, 6. That's Hebrews 11, 6. Acts 5, 29. That's Acts 5, 29. And I want you to think about these questions while you're going over that. Okay? First, is faith and work separate or are they connected? Why or why not? This is what I want you to do. I want you to look at God's word and I want you to answer this question based on what you study. Okay? I don't want you to base it on what I'm telling you. I want you to base what is said on here based on what God's word says. Please leave out any teaching or doctrine that you may have picked up along the way. I want you to read what the Bible says and only what the Bible says. Follow the direction that Jesus Christ leads us in. Okay? Faith and works, are they separate or are they connected? Why or why not? Okay? Is obedient faith different from faith only? We talked about that a little bit ago. Which is more scriptural, uh, more, the more scriptural principle? Okay, so which one's closest to what God wants in scripture? Based on what we've read in verses 1 through 7 and what you're studying in these verses up here. Okay? Can work only or faith only be an issue in our walk? I want you to really answer that question. Can work only or faith only be an issue in our walk? The reason I want you to answer that is because I want you to think about that. Grace alone and grace only, faith only, all I got to do is believe, all I got to do is believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to heaven, or I can work my way to heaven. That's all I have to do. I just have to be a better person. I have to walk and do my best. And here's what I would recommend you also look up with that. Search Benjamin Franklin on that. Benjamin Franklin tried that. He tried to say, oh, well, I can live a good, uh, very uh, principled life and not have to worry about obeying the rules because I'm going to be perfect. I can perfect my walk and, and I won't stumble. Not even Ben Franklin could do it, okay? So none of us can do it. None of us can do it. The work is done through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we need to look at that as well. Can work only or faith only be an issue in our walk? Think about that, okay? All right, so the next one. I want to talk about call to be saints. We need to talk about sanctification again, okay? Let's look at these verses real quick, all right? Study more on the word on the saints in God's word, okay? You can look at Acts 26.10. That's verses 26.10 in the book of Acts. Philippians 4.21, Philippians 4.21, Ephesians 4.12, Ephesians 4.12, and 1 Corinthians 1.2, 1 Corinthians 1.2. Those are places where the word saint come in. And now I've got some questions for you to think about there too. True or false, okay, true or false, real easy one, all Christians are saints, true or false. Based on what scripture says, are all Christians saints? You can go review that. There are people that will go and try to disagree with you on this, but let's go by what the Bible says, not what, can, what, what some canon over here says or what some idea or philosophy says over here. Let's go with what scripture says, okay? What do the words sanctified and saint mean, okay? Take time out, look those up. Okay, sanctified, sanctification, same thing, and saint. Find out what those mean, okay? Dig in. Do internet searches, use Google, use uh, DuckDuckGo, whatever you want to use, okay? Find you a search engine, put it in there. Find out what the word sanctified and saint mean as it refers to the Bible, not other people's doctrine, the Bible. And why is it important to be sanctified? Why is it important for Christians to be sanctified? I talked about it just a few minutes ago, but I want you to really think about that. And then I want you to apply it to your walk. 
How can I live a more sanctified life for Jesus Christ? Write it down. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to do any of that. Go with what Scripture says. Okay? Go with what the Scripture says. And go with what your heart says. How can I apply this to my life? See, that's the biggest part of studying the Bible. The biggest part of studying the Bible is not knowing something to win an argument. It is knowing how can I use God's Word in my life to improve what God wants me to be for others. That's what servanthood is. Being willing to give ourselves to others in the name of God. Be willing to do that. Okay? Study that. Come up with that. Find out what you're thinking on that. Okay? And, and don't worry. I'm not going to grade anything. I'm not going to go and hammer it home. I just want you to study it. Okay? I'll come up with a answer guide and post it next week for any questions on that. And I'll give you some other links on that as well. So for next week. All right, here's what you're going to be doing for next week. All right, for next week's study. I want you to read back over Romans 1 through 7 several times. Not seven times, okay? Not 70 times seven, okay? I want you to go over the book of Romans 1, 1 through 7 a few times, okay? And, and, and find a nice quiet time to do it. Take you some time, read it, study it, Okay? Difference between reading it and studying it. Reading it's going, okay, and done. Studying it is looking at that and saying, hmm, what's this mean here? And looking into it and seeing what that means. Whether you go and look online or whether you contact me, whatever you need. We want to be able to help you study the scripture. That's what this class is for. We want to be able to help you study the scriptures and get more involved with Jesus Christ. So read that a couple of times this week. Go over the application questions in this lesson, which I just put in there. And if you want some more study, I'd have some more of that too. If you would like more questions to review this lesson, you can download the Romans 1-8 through 8 study guide on our website. It's in the handout brochure section at www.lifelessonbibleanswers.com. Okay, lifelessonsbibleanswers.com. And you can get into that as well, okay? get into that it's a little different structure and it doesn't cover everything I covered and it actually can cover more than I covered but I want you to take time out and use those tools that you have to be able to dig into God's Word and see what it says okay also for next week I want you to read Romans 1 8 through 16 okay Romans 8 1 through 16 not a lot to read okay you're only reading 17 verses essentially it's all you're doing but I want you to keep reading it Read it once, twice a day, whatever you can do, whatever you can get in, and study it. Take time out, do the study questions, read what that says, get involved, okay? There is a difference to going and attending a Bible study for one hour and actually going and studying the Bible for one hour, okay? You can go with what I say, but I don't want you to do that. I'm asking you, as a student of the Bible, to go out and study God's Word, okay? Get out there and study and read what God's Word says, okay? So chapter 1, 1 through 7, chapter 1, 8 through 16 by next week. And answer key for both the application questions, which I put in here, and the study guide for this week will be available next week before the lesson. I'll put it on uh, the Facebook page with a link on there. All you got to do is just look at that and download it, okay? And if you have any questions on this study, Feel free to email us at any time. That's at info at lifelessonsbibleanswers.com. You can read that right there. We've got a new email address. It's no longer a Gmail address. It's info at lifelessonsbibleanswers.com. Okay? And that's this week's lesson in the book of Romans. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you had time. I hope you uh, took time to take the notes. And like I said, I will be going and posting the PowerPoint that was posted over here. I will have that PowerPoint uh, for you to be able to read, look at, and to explore on that end. Uh, immediately following the class, I'll have that available to you with a link in the description up here. If you have any other questions, info at lifelessonsbibleanswers.com. Okay, lifelessonsbibleanswers.com is where you'll want to go for any of your, uh, any information, any downloads. We have free textbooks, we have free uh, brochures, Everything that we put on there is free for you to look at 
and free for you to download. There is no charge whatsoever. It's freely provided because God has freely provided. And we want to be able to give you a place where you can go and study God's Word directly and encourage you and inspire you to keep pressing on for the faith. Folks, I want to take time out again to thank you for tuning in with us this week. Thank you for studying with us. If you have any questions, just feel free to message us on Facebook or message us at uh, lifelessonsbibleanswers.com. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. Come back next week. We'll see you again soon. Take care and enjoy the journey we have with Jesus Christ this week. Love you. God bless.